Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to Hidden Life of Water at San Jose State University. My name is Dr. Molly Hankwitz, and I probably know a few of you from my Art 72 Design and Society class, uh, which meets at this time. Uh, okay, we have quite a full program, so I want you to listen. We've got amazing uh, presenters. We have poets. We have uh, presenters very committed to what they do in terms of water. And today is the UN designated World Water Day, which was designated in 1993 to recognize the conditions of water the world over as a global commons, if you will, of shared a shared resource which is finite on our fragile planet Earth. So that is what we're celebrating today, in part the end or near end or possible end of drought in California, which has been so severe, and the beautiful rain which has been falling for the last month or so. Uh, there are other words for that rain, which I'll let our environmental studies panel tell you about, like atmospheric river. But um, I like to think of it as beautiful rain after the drought. So our, our program today um, begins with the panel, To the Extreme, Understanding Flood and Drought in California with uh, three experts from our environment, two experts from our environmental studies program, and one expert who is the director of our Office of Sustainability at San Jose State. And they will be talking about drought and flood, and hopefully provide all of you with some necessary knowledge about water, which is so mercurial and so uh, erratic and so wonderful and powerful and scary and uh, we've heard we know so much about climate crisis but knowledge is power and if we can gain knowledge we can also gain uh, intellectual emotional physical control over water uh, at the so they're going to speak for maybe 25 minutes, and they'll open up the floor to questions. We have a microphone, which will come to you if you have a question. I hope my students will have questions. You may have gotten one of these on the way in, or you may have brought one of these postcards with you. The back is blank, so if while listening you want to write down your thoughts, draw pictures, uh, your whatever, you know, words of promise you want to put on there. We are going to be collecting them for hopefully for exhibition at Earth Day, which is another celebration we do here on campus. Uh, many of you probably also received stickers, so don't forget to uh, post about World Water Day uh, because it's one way we have in this large planet of having sort of a focus or a lens on water and of celebrating our unique relationships to this element. Okay, I wanted to thank a few people before the panel gets started. Uh, after the panel, I'm gonna say we will have a little intermission. And then I hope you can stay for the rest of the afternoon because we have two incredible presenters, Dr. Robin Lasser, Professor Lasser from the art department who has Done an, uh, does an amazing body of work about fire and water and the relationship of these two elements. Um, and in California, of course, we have fires uh, that are also quite devastating and we have drought and we have a very, she's brought together this very complex and interesting and emotional presentation about these two elements and how they interweave. And then after her, we have Professor Joel Slayton, who's going to be beaming in on Zoom from his outpost in the Gila River in Arizona, where he and his partner have been doing an environmental art project for many months. Uh, the Gila River is one of the most impacted ecosystems in the U.S. from the 
recent drought, and Dr. Slayton uh, will be talking to you about their work there. After that, we'll close the program with two of San Jose's most eminent poets, Shika Malavia and Arlene Biala, in a duet of poetry called uh, Dreaming of Convergence. So that is the full afternoon. I want to thank very much uh, the, all of the presenters who are just amazing and committed to the environment and to the work around the environment, which is so press pressing now. And I also wanted to thank the Hammer Theater staff for their expertise and professionalism in getting this event off the ground. I want to thank my students in 72 for their great comments about water that they've been writing and in their study of the UN's World Water Day um, and their hopeful comments about how they're going to save water and use water and think about water. And I want to thank uh, as well my technical coordinator and student assistant, Michael Falanc, who's been an absolute, uh, just incredibly helpful in my pulling this together. Uh, I curated the program and organized it with grant money from the Humanities and Arts in Action program at San Jose State, so I also want to thank that program. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists, uh, Dr. Catherine Cushing, my collaborator, Dr. Costanza Rampini from Environmental Studies, and Debbie Andres, Director of the Office of Sustainability. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Should we do a sound check? Is the mic on? Hello. Yep. <laughs> on. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you can hear me okay. Yes? Okay. Great. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, we're so excited uh, to talk to you today about one of our favorite subjects, uh, which is water. Um, I know that most of you are you know, living in the Bay Area. Um, for, for, for all of you, I'm just curious by a show of hands, for how many of you has this been the wettest uh, winter that you can remember being? Yeah, crazy, crazy, crazy. So you might have some questions about why is this happening, right? And also, why, are, why is California weather uh, so extreme, right? Not too long ago before, as we were entering, um, as we were entering this rainy season, we were entering our third year of very, very dry, um, uh, precipitation. So we were actually worried that we were entering into a drought and then lo and behold we have 12 atmospheric rivers come through. So it's really really crazy. So what we're what we'd like to do today is tell you a little bit more about droughts and floods and how you can kind of understand it from a scientific perspective but also thinking about the relationship between human systems and natural systems around the hydrologic cycle. We need everyone to be involved in this water con uh, conversation. So we're so glad that you're here today. Um, so my name's Catherine Cushing. I'm chair of the Environmental Studies Department. Um, I'm here with Costanza Rampini, who's also a faculty member in my department, and Debbie Andres. And we're gonna, we're gonna get started now. So next slide, please. Okay, so what are droughts? Um, it's not rocket science. Uh, droughts are just periods of abnormally dry weather, um, drier than normal, and they cause a bunch of different um, impacts that you all are pretty familiar with. Um, how many of you are from California? Yes, okay, show of hands. Okay, how many of you have uh, driven through kind of the almond orchards in the Central Valley? Yes, okay. How many of you remember um, between like 2012 and 2017 when some of the almond orchards actually, like they went fallow, people stopped watering them, they just couldn't uh, find enough irrigation water and those trees actually fell down? Do you remember like driving through? Yeah, so very, very severe, okay? So you can have reduced uh, plant growth, you can have crop failure. Um, there's a phenomena that we have um, called the water table. So if you imagine kind of this is the ground surface, okay, at a certain distance below the ground, uh, which we call the water table, all the interstitial spaces are filled with water, okay? So if you dig a well, 
down past the water table, you will hit water. And what was happening during the last drought cycle between 2012 and 2017, that the water table was dropping farther and farther down and growers were really in trouble. So when we say well loss, that means that a well that you had dug that normally provided water wasn't providing water anymore. So that's another negative impact of drought. Um, user shortages, um, how many of you remember being asked to conserve water at home? Yes, okay, 20 gallons a day per household. Um, endangered species loss. Um, so we have, for example, some really amazing species of anadromous fish like um, salmon and rainbow trout. Um, they're very, very picky species. Um, they like the water very cold. They like the water very clear. They like gravel to lay their eggs in. Um, and so when droughts take place, um, stream flow is reduced. Um, volume in streams is reduced. It gets hotter. Um, and those types of fish that have very sensitive life cycles, they don't, um, they don't like it um, and they don't, um, they don't lay as many eggs. So these are just some examples of drought, um, drought impacts. Um, there's also other negative effects such as wildfire, increased wildfire risk. Um, so our last drought was in uh, 2012 to 2017. Um, and this is just kind of an example that I used um, for my classes. Okay, that's my visual aid. Okay, so this is a T-square. Um, so average annual rainfall in California is about here, 22 inches, okay? So during the last drought cycle in one particular water year, um, this is how much water uh, came down. So it's a lot, it's very severe, all right? So this is how bad it can get when we talk about drought. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then from a visual perspective, you can see um, it looks like there's just this tiny river, this little oasis, man-made oasis in this sea of brown. Um, and this was in 2015 in the Central Valley. So you know, these are the ki kinds of things that water planners are worried about when we talk about drought. Um, oftentimes for water resources management, we think about having enough resources you know, to last us three years, three really dry years. Now we're starting to think about, well, we need to plan in advance maybe for five years because these conditions are happening more frequently. Uh, next slide, please. So this next slide gives you a little bit more context. Oh, okay, thank you for the pointer. <laughs> okay, let me stick this right here. Um, so what you can see here, all right, is it going, ah, can y'all see this little dot? Yes, okay. So basically the main point of this graphic is that droughts and temperature may be related. So our last two drought cycles happened pretty close together. Here, 2012 to 2015, and then two years before that, okay? One reason why we're a little concerned in California is you can see these happened in really close succession to each other. So not a good thing from a water resources management perspective. The previous drought was in the 1990s and then going farther back. So what you can see here is in California, actually some of our hottest years have been in the last 10 years, right? So this is the temperature, this is the, um, this is the graph of temperature, right? So these red bars above the line are above average temperatures. And you can see that they actually kind of match this pattern of lower than average waterfall, okay? Lower than average precipitation. They don't necessarily match up here, right? So we don't have a complete picture yet, but this is disconcerting. And when you think about phenomena like climate change, there's simply just more energy, right? More energy in the atmosphere. Um, water that used to be kind of near the surface, um, there's just a lot of power in evaporation. So we just have more energy in the atmosphere. So that leads to you know, a greater frequency of extreme events like droughts and floods. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so we all kind of live this, right? That things can change pretty quickly. So in a matter of five months, we went from a large portion of the state being in the worst stages of drought. Um, so we have these kind of different categories of drought. They go from D0 to D4. And a big chunk of the state was in stages D3 and D4, okay? And that was in October. We fast forward five months, 
Okay, and what do we see here? Okay, actually none of the state is in the most severe drought stages, and some of the state is actually completely out of drought. Okay, so that has been a phenomenal change in our water resources condition in just five months. So things can change fast. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are floods? Um, well, floods are basically the opposite of drought. Um, these are unexpected, um, you know, uh, overflows of water where land is usually dry. So these are pictures actually from the 2017 President's Day flood. Was anybody here then? Maybe you don't remember. Oh. Okay, I see one. Yeah, I see one. I see one. Yeah. So, so actually, so before this water season, um, that was the costliest uh, flood in Santa Clara County history. 14,000 people had to be evacuated, and um, they estimated that it cost about $100 million worth of damage. So I, I think this image is so startling. This is from Anderson uh, Dam, which for reasons, not only because of heavy rainfall, but also because there's a seismic retrofit issue with the reservoir, um, they had to do a, a release, you know? So it looks very, uh, it's just a startling image that I wanted to share with you. And then this is um, from one of the neighborhoods uh, near Coyote Creek where we're evacuating um, some families. So there's just a lot of damage that can occur because of floods that we need to be aware of. Um, this last season has been un unprecedented. They estimate that over a billion dollars worth of damage has been caused by the 12 atmospheric rivers that have taken place and over 20 people unfortunately have lost their lives. Next slide, please. Okay, so why was this year so extreme? Um, Marion Webster does a, like a contest every year about like the word of the year. So maybe the word of the year for 2023 will be atmospheric river, because I think that we've, we've heard this term a lot. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we've had such unprecedented rainfall this particular you know, water year, is because you have a jet stream, which is like moving all this air, and then you have a very concentrated plume of air that has a, that's carrying a lot of moisture. Um, so these past um, atmospheric rivers that we've had have actually been like not very cold. They call those like the Pineapple Express. And so these plumes are much more directed and much more concentrated. And I think all of us have had that experience where um, sometimes it feels like the water, it's like raining buckets, right? It's like the, the rain is so strong. And that's kind of the reason why is because we're having more of these atmospheric rivers as opposed to just regular precipitation events. Um, so, so that kind of gives us the setting for you know, what are droughts and what are floods, and then how do we think a little bit more about what's happening to our water supply. And then Dr. Rampini is going to talk to you all about um, some of the most vulnerable populations that are really at risk in these types of events. So I'm going to turn over to Costanza. Thank you. All right, so I might try to stand in a second. I'm not used to talking while sitting down, but uh, <laughs> my name is Costanza Rampini, also a professor in environmental studies. And so the picture you're seeing here, these are our largest reservoirs in California. They're incredibly important because a lot of our water is stored in the Sierra Nevadas, right? They're our water tower. They release water for us when we most need it in the summer, and they store it in the form of snow and ice packs during the winter. So what you're seeing here, I didn't update it since I think I got this March 15th, so this is about a week ago. But you can see the state of our reservoirs, of our largest reservoirs in California as of a week ago. And our two largest reservoirs are Shasta and Oroville. And you can see the green line is the historical average of where we would expect the water to be about at this time of the year. And then the sort of the yellow box is the maximum capacity of that reservoir to store water. Beyond that capacity, you have to release water or else you get some of what was shown in the previous slides with the Anderson Dam overflowing. And so this is great. This is really good news for us, right? We have all been through a lot in the past few weeks. I know I was without power for the last full day, um, without internet all of today as well. So 
I'm not trying to undermine the difficulties that these storms have created for all of us here in the room, but I think it's important to think about the fact that we are currently out of a drought, and that is very welcome news. Uh, additionally, we really see our reservoirs are doing great, which means we're gonna be doing pretty well this summer as well. I'm not saying go and turn on all your faucets and let the water run right now. Uh, we still wanna be mindful, right? This is water that we can store for years and years to come, and so this is our future right here. But this is great news because then you can see the, the blue is where we currently are. And pretty much all of our reservoirs right now are above their historical average. They're not necessarily full, but they're above our historical average, which means we're doing great as compared to what we've seen since really 2012. We hadn't seen anything like this uh, since prior to the mega drought that we came out of in 2017 with the President's Day flood. Next slide, please. So here is a picture of the Oroville Dam spillway. Um, I'm glad that Dr. Cushing showed that other image of the Anderson um, Dam, because if you remember, in 2017, Oroville was in the news a lot. Do you remember the picture of the Oroville spillway just eroding as a result of all of those floods? And they evacuated 188,000 people beneath that dam because they were afraid the dam would actually collapse because there was so much water in 2017. Um, but they fixed it with a lot of support and federal support. <laughs> the spillway has been fixed. This is the new spillway. I think it's about the width of 15 highway lanes. So it's a giant spillway, and now they're releasing water. This was just a week ago or so, um, 12 days ago. They released water for the first time in many, many years to make room for this current flood that we're dealing with now, this current rain event. Um, again, so you know, dams are used for a variety of purposes. One of the things we like them for is they hold our water that we need to use in the summer. They also provide hydroelectricity, but they also can provide flood protection if we lower the reservoir levels ahead of an upcoming flood so that there is room for that reservoir to hold some of that rain so it doesn't destroy communities downstream. So this is exactly what happened in this picture. They're releasing water to lower the level of the reservoir so that the communities downstream can be protected from floods. Next slide, please. So one thing that I want to talk about with this graph, and I'll explain it in a second. You don't have to read all that. Don't worry about it. I'll explain it for you. Um, so students are always asking me, like, wow, is this really abnormal what we're seeing right now? And no, it's not, right? California always swings between droughts and atmospheric rivers. We've seen this since the history of California, right? The dawn of, of us living here. This has always happened. We're seeing that these events are becoming more extremes sometimes closer to each other, right? So it is unprecedented what we're seeing this winter. But in general, California always does this. We always swing from too dry to too wet. Too much water or too little water to too much water. Um, and one thing that's really important, I think, for us to keep in mind is that the way we have modified our rivers is one of the key problems for why we are dealing with all these difficulties, these floods, and um, having to evacuate, et cetera. So this graph here is what we call a hydrograph. You're seeing on your y-axis discharge, so the amount of water in the river. And on your x-axis, this is time. And you have two lines here. The yellow line is what a river would normally behave like a natural river that hasn't been engineered, modified, channelized, cemented, undergrounded, would act like this. It would have these pulses. When you have floods, you have a pulse here, big pulse, a little pulse, another medium-sized pulse. And then the flow of the river would be more steady throughout the rest of the year. What happens is that, as you notice, here we, are two, we have two rivers really near campus. Can anybody tell me what they are? Go ahead. Coyote Creek, maybe? Coyote Creek? Guadalupe, right? We have two rivers right here. We also have the Los Gatos Creek, which meets with the Guadalupe right here downtown. Um, so we are in the, midst, you know, in the middle of a lot of urban streams, but a lot of us don't even notice that. So I have a lot of students for the first time when they take my water field studies class, environmental studies 270, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, they go to the river for the very first time and one of the reasons is that we've done everything to hide the rivers from our view, to underground them, and we have cemented their channel, we've channelized them, we've modified their channels. Um, we've connected them with each other in ways that they weren't connected before. And also, we have poured cement all over, right? We have seen so much urbanization in this area that used to be called the Valley of Heart's Delights. I think I said it right, okay. And this used to be orchards, they used to be, you know, 
farmland, and now it's very heavily urbanized areas, tech campuses, et cetera, et cetera, universities. And this is the result of it, this red line here. Because we have all these impervious surfaces, impervious means impermeable, right? The water can't go through the cement. So all this water that's coming down from the sky is entering our river channels all at once. Instead of trickling down to the groundwater, the Dr. Cushing was just talking about trickling down into our soils, it's all joining the river. And so we have these huge pulses instead and then very dry periods. This is what we call the flashy hydrograph. And it's part of a bigger problem that is called the urban stream syndrome. So urban river syndrome, which means we have these very unpredictable kind of hydrographs where when it rains, we get these huge floods, and then we see just so little water in our rivers the rest of the year. If you walk by the Guadalupe River in August, you can barely see water sometimes in there. We also see a lot more pollutants entering the river, in part because all of this rain that is washing our sidewalks and washing off all this oils and all this pollution is coming and entering our river system. There is less biodiversity, so less riparian species living in the rivers or along the rivers. Um, and also, uh, yeah, so just, just less predictable and it's not a natural river anymore. They're not natural rivers. They don't behave in the way that this yellow line would behave. Next graph, or next slide. And one of the things that I think a lot about when I think about rivers and I think about our urban streams is the people who live closest to them, right? We have a lot of communities that live near the rivers here, but the people that live closest to the river, sometimes in the riverbeds, right, during the dry period, are people experiencing homelessness. So the people who live and sleep outside are by far the ones who experience the most that flashy hydrograph, right? Super dry riverbeds, practically inexistent trickle of water, or huge spikes in water volume that mean you have to evacuate, all your stuff is getting washed away. And here in the Bay Area, we have a very large population of houseless people, homeless, houseless, I will use those terms interchangeably. Um, some people have speculated as to why. Um, some people talk about this magnet effect that because we are perhaps more tolerant than other parts of the country or maybe even of the state that we're seeing a concentration of people who are experiencing homelessness coming here. That's not necessarily true. This um, is true more at the regional level. So people within the region might um, gravitate towards urban centers, but they're not coming from Florida to live houseless along our rivers here, right? So this is more of a regional effect. Um, next slide, please. The thing that is most concerning, however, about our population here in the San Francisco Bay Area is that have, we have one of the nation's largest unsheltered homeless population, meaning they do not live in shelters and they do not have any sort of short-term living habitations where they can go. So they're mostly living and sleeping outside. And you can see in this graph here, it's showing you, this is the nine Bay Area counties, and in blue, you have your sheltered homeless folks, and in yellow or orange are the unsheltered people experiencing homelessness. So you see the numbers are really staggering. And this is very important for us thinking about water because once again, these communities are living along our riverbanks, near our riverbanks, sometimes in the riverbed itself. And they are the most vulnerable people, right? When we think about climate change, and unfortunately most of our climate plans, the climate action plans that cities and counties are developing do not consider homeless folks at all. But our homeless community members are really the ones who cannot protect themselves, can have the least capacity to cope with events, extreme events, like floods, like droughts, like heat waves. Next one. And, and this is my last slide, but uh, this is a picture, by the way, from the Guadalupe River Park. So if you walk along the Guadalupe River Park, you'll see this. Here would normally be the river. This are gabions, so these are rocks and like chicken wire used to prevent riverbank erosion, and they're flood uh, protection devices. And here you see a whole bunch of tents of people who are living along it, and so you see that they're living within the path of the floods of the river. Um, and this is very important because we need to think about them. Right? We need to think about when we see 14,000 people evacuated because Coyote Creek is overflowing, what does this mean for these folks? Where are they going? Right? How are, are they being evacuated? Are, they being, are people helping them move their stuff or not? The other thing that's really important for us to think about is that based on where homeless encampments are and the kinds of characteristics of those houseless encampments, it can also really change the way the river behaves. 
So we know that there is a lot of trash and litter entering the river as a result of the lack of services provided to houseless folks. So it's easier to get new clothes donated than to wash your clothes if you're homeless. It's easier to get free food than to make food for yourself, right? And so you end up having all this food packaging, a lot, a lot of clothes end up in the river. And when we have a lot of trash entering the river, it really modifies the natural flow of the river. So when you have floods, the river wants to go in a certain direction, but if it's blocked by a bunch of you know, mattresses, illegal dumping, clothes, et cetera, it might take a different turn. It might spill more than we want it to. So I think this is very important for us to think about both in terms of how can we better serve our homeless communities, provide services that aren't necessarily right away housing, because this, we, we're currently operating under a housing first mentality, which means housing or nothing, but providing 24 hour bathrooms, shower, laundry services, storage service, so people when they do have to evacuate, their important documents, their family pictures, they're already stored somewhere, right? So they don't have to rush and try to find help or find somebody with a vehicle to help them move their important things. So if we can start providing some of these more lower hanging fruits, is what I like to call them, instead of only focusing on we need to build more housing, most of us can't afford housing, right, in this part of the country. So it's, it's very hard to imagine how we're gonna house every single folk who's currently living and sleeping outside. But there are these low-hanging fruits that we can try to achieve, and I really hope that all of you can start to advocate for some of those, um, so that we can both help the conditions of people who live and sleep outside and improve the dignity of their lives and also improve the health of our streams so that hopefully when we do have floods, we don't have issues with litter blocking the flow of the river and the, regi the flow regime can be more natural even though we've already sort of changed it significantly. Thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, okay, is that good? Um, hi, I'm Debbie Andres. I'm with the Office of Sustainability at San Jose State, and, and you've heard from the state level and, and the regional level, um, but I wanted to talk to you about what exactly our campus is doing um, for water conservation. Um, and water conservation, I mean, you've heard, we're, you've seen a lot, of, a lot of rain, and you probably are thinking conservation isn't super important, but as Dr. Rampini said, we'll always have a drought, we'll always have um, rain and both of those events will just get more and more extreme. So it's important to continue with our habits of conservation um, as well as, you know, if we're not, well, let me go for my first slide here. Um, our, our main strategy for reducing water use and conservation at San Jose State is we use recycled water. And what is recycled water? So a picture, that picture right there that you're seeing is a picture of uh, the South Bay Recycling Water Facility. It's um, located in El Viso, Milpitas border area. And when you flush your toilets or use a sink or your shower or you wash your clothes, all that water goes here um, and it gets treated. And historically, that water would go right to the bay. Um, perfectly safe water, but it was like, well, we're treating this water, we're using this energy um, for treating this water. How can we use that instead of just dumping it in the bay? Um, and that's what South Bay Water Recycling did, is they installed more um, treatment facilities there so that we can actually use that treated wastewater, retreat it a little bit more so that we can use it for non-potable uses. And when I say non-potable, potable, I mean drinking water versus non-drinking uses, right? So we use it for like irrigation. Um, lots of golf courses use uh, recycled water. Um, we use it for flushing toilets. Um, and that is a, an extremely effective way of how our campus has reduced um, non-potable, sorry, potable water use. Um, and and the, the other added benefit is, you know, instead of pulling from you know, our reservoirs, our wells, actually our, our campus is, um, our water use is mostly from underground sources. We are using water that would just get dumped anyway. So we're saving water in multiple ways. Um, this is our first way that we reduced water on campus. We actually converted our central plant. If you don't know, we have a central plant on campus. It provides about 80% of our electricity and our heating and, um, cooling usage on campus. And we have this huge um, cooling tower that uses a lot of water, and that was the first thing that we converted. We started using that um, 
We started using recycled water for that, saving about 16 million gallons per year. Um, and then in 2006, we did a lot of changes into the plant, saving more money, and then, or <laughs> saving some more water. Um, and then in 2017, um, we have a steam boiler that provides heating for our campus. And um, that was our last major use of water on campus. And we finally converted that to recycled water using, um, saving about 30 million gallons of water. That picture there is right inside of our cooling tower. It's, it's if you would like a tour of that, um, you can definitely tour our central plant. It's a really cool facility. Um, irrigation and our fountains. Irrigation it was our second biggest use of water on campus, and that was our next biggest conversion. Uh, we started at South Campus in 2001, right after our plant. Um, that picture you see there is actually um, the golf facility at South Campus, so that's a, a more recent conversion. But we did that in 2001, and then, to, and then 10 years later, we converted Main Campus. So all of our irrigation on Main Campus uses recycled water. Um, and then 2018, we actually converted all of our outdoor fountains. Again, recycled water is perfectly safe. I think it's just the idea of you know, where it came from that kind of grosses people out. Perfectly safe water. Still don't drink it, but it's perfectly safe water. It, to, to be honest, you can probably drink it and you'll be totally fine. Um, but uh, there's signs everywhere, don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> And then our, our final conversion is uh, indoor plumbing. So dual plumbing, the, the system that we have in our, our newest buildings, starting from the library. Um, dual plumbing means there's two plumbing systems in each building. One is for like the water that goes to your sinks and your showers. Um, and the other one goes to our toilets. So we flush, uh, starting with MLK, we flush all of our toilets with recycled water. And then any building that was built after that or uh, refurbished after that, like Student Union, um, all use recycled water. Um, and in 2019 was actually a really cool project. Um, it was you know, not super visible and not that, that exciting really, but it was really cool. We built a recycled water main on San Carlos. Um, and so we were able to, we, we, we are able to use recycled water for flushing for um, CV2, um, SRAC, uh, the Wellness Center, and um, Spartan Complex. And um, yes, and that main actually connects to the other part of San Jose. So we were able to connect other parts of our city to recycled water, um, you know, because we're part of a really urban community. And um, all in all, that saves about for 10 million gallons a year. Um, and basically the, the mandate for any new buildings is that we use recycled water for, for all flushing. Um, all in all, we save uh, over 100 million gallons a year and um, we use more recycled water than potable, which is a huge accomplishment. Uh, I think it's like 65% uh, we use for recycled. And, um, and I did wanna to touch on stormwater because we do, that is a, a problem now that we do have to contend with. Um, what, what are we doing on campus to prevent our facilities from, from storm? Um, well, if you see these, these unruly patches of grass on campus, you, you will see them um, pretty uh, commonly now. Um, they are bioswales. Um, they're not meant to like play on because they, they are uneven. <laughs> don't, don't go in there, there's a big ditch in the middle. But they're, <laughs> they're, uh, de they're designed to capture storm water. Um, and for two reasons, one, they actually help filter out the stormwater. If you notice, stormwater has typically has like a, an oily film on top. So it does prevent some stormwater from or water um, contaminated with oil getting back to our bay, but it also helps recharge our aquifers. Um, so we have that, and, and I actually found a super interesting article that um, a couple of local sites after our recent storm events monitored how much storm water they, they reduced by having bioswales, and it was like up to 45%. So obviously that's helping our campus as well. Um, we also have pervious pavement. If you, Dr. Rampini mentioned pavement isn't pervious, and so water tends to run off, but we actually have um, pervious pavement, which means it, it does the same thing. It filters out stormwater and it recharges our aquifers. And that's um, located um, around SRAC mostly. Um, and then uh, we do have a running stormwater management program, which is basically housekeeping. It's keeping our storm drains clean. Um, it's cleaning up our streets um, in, our, in our walkways. And then we do a lot of preventative maintenance. Um, I do encourage you, if you actually do see uh, leaks and um, 
any water problems that you notice, you can actually report that on our work order system. Anyone can, you don't have to work here, you can be a student. So if you do notice a problem, please report it to our facilities and they will investigate. Yep. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you, Debbie. Nice to you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, sometimes we get questions from our students, you know, what can we do to be kind of better, better water advocates or better water stewards, you know, really what can we do to prepare for these more extreme periods of dry and wet? And so I just, you know, one thing I like to tell people is just educate everyone everywhere all the time, water is all around us. And I think oftentimes we take it for granted because you, you know, you wake up in the morning, you go brush your teeth, you turn on the faucet, the water is always there, but we haven't really thought about how much work it actually takes to get water to us. So for example, people in Mountain View, their water comes from Hetch Hetchy, right? Hetch Hetchy is in Yosemite, right? That's almost 200 miles away. Like it goes through this amazing gravity fed system, you know, just to, you know, allow people in Mountain View to brush their teeth. So like a greater appreciation of kind of how the human uh, interface and the natural hydrologic cycle interact is something that we can all kind of think a little bit more carefully about. And I also think about a quote from uh, Richard Louvre who wrote the book, um, Last Child in the Woods, thinking about how, how can we better connect to the natural environment. And you'll see some amazing images from the next speaker that I hope you can think about because when we ask our students to kind of close their eyes and think about their favorite places and just kind of meditate on that for a moment, and then afterwards we ask them what kinds of places the, they imagined, almost 90% of all the students have some water in their favorite image. Water is a really, really important part of what we think about. I mean, I know, for example, some members of my family, they can't wake up in the morning without a long, hot shower. It's like part of their personal meditation. So thinking about your personal relationship to water, and if this is something that you're interested in, um, Costanza actually is an expert in these you know, social ecological systems, like understanding these systems better is really the key to how we manage for these more extreme events. Like never before have we had to, you know, cancel class because of wind, right? I mean, these are crazy things, you know, because we have increased wildfire risks because of drought, you know, we have poor air quality. So all these environmental issues and human interactions, they're all related and we all have a, a role to play in that. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't, I can't read, <laughs> the text is so small. Okay, oh, the other thing I really wanted to encourage us to think about is the relationship between surface water and groundwater. We don't realize it, but underneath our feet is really the most valuable source of water that we have. All the best spaces to save water, Costanza was talking about the reservoirs, those are above ground storage systems, huge evaporative loss, right? But if you think about it, you know, we have this great system underneath our feet, that water storage is like essentially free to us if we could do a better job managing our storm water and recharging water where it makes sense, you know, and recycling water, matching the quality of water uh, to its actual application. Like, I mean, there's always these, uh, you know, cartoons about uh, dogs drinking out of the toilet, right, <laughs> the water, like, because why are we going to the bathroom, you know, and using drinking water to flush our toilets? You don't, you don't need to do that. And actually, I know, I think at Cal, they actually have like a waterless urinal. You don't need water for some of these things. I know, maybe that's going too far, but there are different ways to match water quality to water use that can really free up a lot of the, the water we've been using for better purposes. Um, and as Costanza said, um, thinking about these vulnerable communities, um, one of the reasons why we don't have big incentives to save water is because we're not paying the actual price of water. So there's been other studies that have shown like the shadow price of water is probably 10 times, um, you know, what, what, it actu what we actually pay for it. We pay tap water costs two cents a gallon, right? I mean, that's just, that's free. That's free compared to rent. So, you know, what, where is the economic incentive for water saving? So that's just another thing for us to be thinking about. And then I had to put in a plug for Debbie. <laughs> I'm like, what, what, what can the students do? They can report lake, uh, leaks. And there's so many classes in HNA and also in the College of Social Sciences, actually classes all over campus that relate to sustainability and water in particular. So if you're, you know, interested in taking any of those classes, I think I put 
my card um, out there. There's also a list of like classes and clubs, and um, we have a really great event coming up um, in April, Earth Day. I don't know, Costanza, if you want to talk about that. I'm happy to talk about it. So April 20th, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. on the Tower Lawn, so in front of the big Tower Building, our oldest building on campus. We are going to be celebrating Earth Day. This is an international holiday. It's technically on April 22nd, but we didn't think we should make you come on a Saturday to get <laughs> We decided to move it to Thursday. Um, we will have Aztec dancing, yoga, tree planting event, music, free food. Free food, did I say that? Free food, um, <laughs> giveaways. And also the theme for this year is water conservation and water recycling. We're gonna have a lot of emphasis on the fact that soon here we will be able to actually drink recycled water from our tap. Um, so Valley Water, who, that's our wholesale water agency, it sells water to the other water agencies that then sell it to you all as consumers. They are moving forward with plans to clean this water, purify this water, and then put it back into our water drinking system. Instead of only using it for landscape purposes or for flushing toilets, we're actually gonna be able to put that into our percolate, sorry, into our groundwater. So we're gonna have this purified water that was initially wastewater, percolate down into our groundwater table and then use it for drinking water. And this is probably, I think, 10 to 15 years away. Um, and this will be really important for all of us here at SGSU and in our larger community to understand the benefits so that there is public acceptance when finally that happens. And Valley Water will come with lots of giveaways. And if you want to volunteer, we also need volunteers and you can get a free shirt. April 20th, 10 a.m. Awesome, um, and I also wanted to say that Debbie's Office of Sustainability also provides um, opportunities for paid internships. So her office does have usually four every year, and there's a great need. I know a bunch of you are creatives. There is a great need for, we need you. Okay, I'm an engineer. I don't know how to draw anything. So we really need the creatives to kind of come together with us so we can work on these things together. Debbie, did you want to yeah, talk yeah, about the work I of your office? Internships um, around May. Um, my, my interns always graduate. Um, <laughs> But around May, and I always hire a couple of creative um, students. It's like we, we have enough, I think, technical knowledge on staff, but it's always the getting the message out there, getting awareness campaigns, getting outreach out there. We need people to that, that make interesting visuals, um, make interesting podcasts, make interesting videos. Um, so I, I definitely love the creatives. So yeah. Uh, keep a lookout for those. Um, we'll be opening more internship positions up in May. Do you have any questions for us? First brave soul. <laughs> Sure. Um, so there's two spots of, um, there's two places right now on campus that have per, uh, non, non-pervious pavement, no, pervious pavement. Uh, one is beyond, one is behind a Student Wellness Center, um, and it looks like asphalt, but it doesn't have like the tar um, that, that makes it really smooth. It's actually kind of gravelly. Um, and so that's what makes it pervious is that there's actually spaces for the water to get through. The other space, the other place where it, there is pervial, permeous, <laughs> I don't know why I'm getting tongue twisted on that, pervious pavement is that um, behind SRAC, and it's actually just blocks. Um, it's like bricks that have- um, Pavers. Yeah, pavers, exactly. That have kind of slots in between them where water just filters right on through. So there's a lot of different pervious pavements. Yeah. What, it's, uh, what was the building called again? SRA, oh, sorry, Student Rec and Aquatic Center. Yeah. The new gym. And, and also, um, I don't know if anybody cuts through behind the Student Wellness Center. I know the people that yeah. skateboard don't like it because it's like really bumping, <laughs> like it's very rough. Um, that's another example of the pervious pavement. So you could see how it's very obvious that the water would just kind of flow through and not um, overflow on the surface. Thank you for that excellent question. Anybody right else? Raise right behind their hand. you. Right behind you. Right behind me. <laughs> 
So when you talk about the uh, statewide drought, does that also take into account neighboring states, including like Nevada, when we share water with that state, does our drought also affect them in that same way or to a greater capacity? That's a good question. Um, so we're actually kind of in a regional mega drought, like in the entire US West. Um, so the way that we actually share resources primarily um, is through um, the Colorado River. So actually eight states share the water of the Colorado River. Um, initially we thought that the flow of the river was going to be I think 17 million acre feet, uh, which is a lot of water, but we actually overestimated the amount of water that the Colorado River could provide to us. And so we're constantly kind of in this state of deficit. And if there's not enough flow, then all these states that kind of take a piece of the flow of the Colorado River, they just get less. And then actually the Colorado River rarely makes it to Mexico. It's actually supposed to go all the way to Mexico. Um, so actually it's a very interesting question because they're renegotiating the Colorado River Compact with some of these new regimes in mind because even though we've had like a really great water year, the West um, in general is experiencing this mega drought. I think it's like, like thousands of years, like the driest that it's ever been in thousands of years. So I think we can't get too complacent, like we're happy. <laughs> Certainly I want, I'm not gonna say no to the water, but I think this larger regional picture is also really, really important. So great question. Thank you. Costanza, do you have anything you wanna add? No. Nope. Any more questions? Hands in the air over there. Okay, I'll come to you. Excuse me. We'll remember you. <laughs> Hello. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, with the um, sorry, it's a little a little hard to talk while I hear my voice. <laughs> um, uh, so. Do you believe that the with the extreme uh, change in climate that um, uh, will this provide a federal approval for um, uh, better reservoirs or like make them more efficient, provide or like have them store more water or even make create new reservoirs as a whole? Good question. So we are already expanding one of our biggest reservoirs here. The New Pacheco Dam Reservoir is gonna it's gonna be bigger than all of the other 10 reservoirs that we currently really rely on. I don't think that it's because we're getting more rain. It's kind of usually the opposite. People use kind of the opposite argument, like, oh, there is less water. We need to make our reservoirs bigger so they can hold more of it when it does fall. Um, so I think in general, there is certainly an interest in trying to, for some reservoirs, expand their capacity. But for the most part, I think that the solution is in the conservation strategies that Debbie has been talking about. Um, I think we, we, we shouldn't count on continuing having really wet years like this one, right? We're probably gonna swing back into another drought fairly soon. And so I'm not a huge fan of dams personally, um, just putting it out there, but <laughs> expanding a reservoir when you know we're not necessarily gonna get more rain. We're not necessarily seeing more rain over the years. We're seeing it more concentrated in small periods of time. I mean, this year's a little different. And so I think you know there are there some questions about why are we expanding a reservoir when reservoirs can only catch the water that falls from the sky, right? It's, and if the water's not falling, you've got these empty reservoirs that just end up being like, ponds with just algae growing on them, right? <laughs> so I think, I think, I don't think that the rain is why we are looking into expanding some of our reservoirs. And the Anderson Dam re uh, retrofit was already slated to happen because it's sitting on a fault line. And so the retrofit is important to make sure that the dam doesn't collapse in case of a large earthquake and doesn't wash out all the communities downstream, which include us. Thank you. I think there was a question here, essentials. Oh, there's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I keep hearing everybody talk about the rain, but we also got snow here in Northern California. So like, how does the snow in the mountains also contribute to the drought and the changes with the reservoirs and stuff like that? Because I know that makes a significant difference as well. 
So our reservoir are mostly made to catch water that comes from the Sierra Nevadas and that uh, melts the snow and the ice that melts from there. The snow we've seen here, you know, probably it melts fairly fast as soon as the temperature went up. I think we saw most of that snow go away. And that really just contributes to sort of our runoff, our urban runoff. Um, either it gets absorbed by the soil, which is also why we're seeing a lot of tree falling. I live in Santa Cruz and Santa Cruz County has seen records amount of tree falls and blocking streets and taking down homes and cars, et cetera. So one of the issues that we're facing is that right now our soils are so saturated, they're so soggy, full of water, that that's becoming an issue in terms of having landslides and tree falling. So I, I don't, you know, I think the, the snow packs and the ice packs that we're referring to that we're very happy about when they're full, it's really in the Sierra Nevadas at these high altitudes. Thank you. Yeah, and just, I know we're talking about water, but the snow melt for, for us actually does, um, affect us because we rely on hydropower. Um, and when that snow melts, it's actually a major source of hydropower for us. It keeps our energy costs down. So we love seeing the snow melt. It's actually a really good thing for us. And, and then maybe to provide a perspective on the Sierra Nevada snowpack, I mean, it is above ground, our best source of free water storage. And we store it there for free, right? 15 million acre feet. Um, in the winter and early spring, and then it melts when we need it most during the dry season, right? Because it basically doesn't rain between Easter and Thanksgiving here, right? So that's a really important source, and it's at like, was it 191% of normal? So um, so we love, we love the snowpack, but I do have a colleague in Santa Clara. She's a hydrologist, and I remember one of the most terrifying talks I ever saw was when she said that the snowpack was going to be almost gone by, by 2050. So, you know, as things get warmer, mm -hmm. the snowpack, we can't rely on it as much anymore. And then that water is going, the snow is going to melt. We need it to stay actually cold right now. We need to stay cold. We need the snow to stay snow until like March, April, May, because then we need the water. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do we have time for one more? Sure. One more question? My question is uh, more so about drinking water. Um, so is there like a big significant difference in drinking tap water to natural spring water? Um, and also, do they come from the same place? Yes. <laughs> natural spring water or what you find in bottled water, is it's all marketing. Um, a lot of it comes from exactly the same place. They probably add like some minerals in it to make it taste better but they literally come from the same place. I think I know there's a couple of companies that say they import it from like Fiji or from S Fjord in Norway or something, but um, those probably, but from what you get from average water bottles and um, what you get out of the tap, it's the same thing. So please, please, please drink tap water. It's perfectly safe. We're one of the few countries in the world that actually regulates clean drinking water. We have, it's against the law to not give you clean drinking water out of your sink. So. Please uh, drink water. Have I will give you free water bottles if you. <laughs> <laughs> reusable. Water. Yes, reusable <laughs> water bottles. <laughs> yeah, on occasion, um, the Environmental Resource Center, which is like a class and a club uh, sponsored by the Environmental Studies Department, we have a Take Back the Tap events where you can do a drink wa drinking water, um, tap water versus bottled water taste test. And we've been doing this for like a decade. And the main difference is whether the water is cold or not, honestly, because cold water just tastes good no matter what. And as the day goes on and as it gets warmer and the ice melts, people start like not liking either of the water types. So it really is about temperature. And if you're worried about just like um, the secondary contaminants like odor or smell, you just get something like a Brita. Those are um, activated carbon filters and those are really, really good at removing like just the things that aesthetically maybe make water look not so pleasing. But I mean, our drinking water is among the best in the world. And if you live in San Francisco or Mountain View or the East Bay, you're drinking 100% of your water comes from Hetch Hetchy, which is literally snow melt from Yosemite. So it's yeah. the tastiest water. It tastes water. good, yes. I always, whenever I go visit friends in San Francisco or the East Bay, I bring like all my water bottles <laughs> with me and I fill all my bottles with their water and they're like, are you crazy? I'm like, you don't know. This tastes so much better than here we have. The water is good here, but it's not as tasty as when you're getting it straight from Yosemite. And the reason for that is, again, we get a lot of our water from underground, so it does have a lot of minerals in it. A perfectly safe water, though, but that it, it's why water tastes different. It's really what the mineral concentration is. Um, all perfectly safe levels, though. 
I know this gentleman had a question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> Austin, right. Yes. Yes. Major, um, anything that's on um, about sustainability or water or nature conservation that maybe you would recommend the average person to, to read? You should take one of my classes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to buy a book. The, the, the book I'm thinking about, oh my god, the, the, my brain, it's, it's a whole book on the history. I can't know why the title is not coming to me right now, but it's like yay thick. So it may be a little more than what you're looking to, but it is. Oh, why can't I think of it right now? Um, it talks about the history of California and how you can literally learn, like, learn about the history of the state just through the history of how we developed water. And it starts with Native American tribes and how they used the water and how they lived near water sources instead of building hundreds of miles of aqueduct to move water to where they wanted to live. And so it's very interesting and it goes through the Spanish period, the Mexican period, all the way until today, the Central Valley Water Project, the State Water Project. And the title is escaping. Oh, it's the historian from Cal, right? Yes, yeah, we both used it for the, the class. We'll find, if you email, my email, I have a, Thank my you. card is at the entrance. If you email me, because both Costanza I'm and I have used this. I'm also happy to lend it to you. Yeah, so. and then this year's campus reading program book, it was focused on sustainability as well. So that's like a really easy read. Um, yeah. And All we can say if we, yes. What's that the one? All yeah. we can say. Yeah, and we have extra copies. <laughs> so just, yeah, come to environment. Yeah, we have a lot of extra copies. <laughs> And I would also say maybe the classic for water in the West is Cadillac uh, Desert oh, yeah. by Mark Reisner. That's a um, great one. So it's a very, it's like he, he has, there's all these colorful characters. It's pretty engaging. It's more like a, like a novel um, than a book. So those are Yeah, great. also one of our um, deans, Anne-Marie Todd, just published a book about the Valley of Heart's Delight and thinking about place base and what it's like to create a sense of place. And so she, she interviewed a bunch of farmers. So it's not directly about water, but it does talk about the sort of the history of farming here in the Silicon Valley and how that's, and, and water is incredibly closely tied to farming. So I would also suggest checking that out. Oh, and there's one other, there's one other book that I've used in class that students really loved. It's called um, The Waterwise Home. Mm -hmm. So for those of you that are DIYers, there's all these really cool things that you can do at home that aren't really hard, um, that allow you to kind of reuse your clothes washer water and like use it for irrigating your backyard. Um, and um, there was this group in Oakland called Gray Water Gorillas. They used to like clandestinely go to people's houses and like replumb so they could reuse their wash water. And now it's all you know permitted and everyone's promoting it. But at the time, um, it was against the law, so they would like do things in secret and like meet at the Oakland Bart Station. It was really funny. So I really love this book, The Water Wise Home. I would greatly recommend it. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Oh, write down comments on postcards, everyone, for Molly. Yeah. So we're going to take a break now uh, until quarter to two. Be back before quarter to three, rather. Uh, Ro Professor Robin Lasser is going to give you a very interesting uh, sort of performance poetry lecture mode about fire and water called Swallowing Water, Breathing Fire at quarter to three. So I'm welcome. Uh, uh, Take a little break. The cafe, I understand, is open. You can find more information at the front uh, entrance. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists. Great panel. Thank you.
Okay, hello, we're now going to have our next presenter. Welcome back, everyone. I know it seems very empty, but you actually are joined by the live stream, no pun intended, for water. Uh, the audience at the San, uh, San Jose State uh, Vimeo page is also watching. So without further ado, I want to introduce our next presenter, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor rather, Robin Lasser, who is uh, going to give a pr presentation called Swallowing Water, Breathing Fire. And I'm very delighted to have her. She's a very, very creative art professor um, who's been working a long time in a variety of media and has turned her sights onto this interesting complexity of the relationship between fire and water. So I'll let her come out and do her program. Thank you. All right. Mighty. That's what I like. Um, wow, you might want to move over here so I can see you. That would delight me completely. So, um, Robin Lasser, and I'm from the photo department at San Jose State University. And this sea of green dotted by some colorful belts and coats make this room into a beautiful river. And I've been making art, investigating aspects of fire and water for over 30 years. Today, I'll share a few facets of work connected to two projects investigating fire and water in the time of climate change. I'd like to invite you on a journey with me to explore the process of making art that often lives in public space. Mostly, I work collaboratively in the public sphere, creating social sculptures and providing opportunities for communities, local and global, to engage in experiences and environmental issues, the relationship between ourselves and the world we occupy. Today, however, I'll share two highly personal projects that dance around the connections between our bodies and the land and address California's relationship with fire and water as the Anthropocene evolves into a Pyrocene. This slide documents an installation of mine at the OSU Museum of Art titled Weather Report, Mother and Daughter. In terms of ways of working, my personal connections with water are often framed by the interviews I conduct with important players in the community who have a stake in water, health, and safety issues, one of whom, Sarah Hill, who's a Cherokee Nation's Attorney General, formerly the Secretary of the Natural Resources, influenced the personal approach I chose to take in the weather report installation. She states that she feels the most important way to find support for water sustainability is to ask each of us to imagine our personal relationship with water. And in that quest, we may discover our deepest point of care and what our personal roles may be as keepers of the watershed. I took her advice to heart and embarked on a deeply personal installation, a collaboration with Irene and my mother in the final four months of her life. The installation holds multiple tensions. The tensions brought about by global warming, longer droughts, rising seas, and stronger storms, as well as the incomprehensible tensions between mother and daughter, the mystery, the tears, the love, The oval metal prints on the wall contain fragments of my mother's poetry, highlighted in a book we created together. The book is installed on the sculpture stand at the head of the room. The book created in the spring of 2020 reflects our joint legacy of loss. Following my mother's wake, three years later, my father dies at age 100. He outlived his firstborn son, my brother, who died just a few weeks ago. Our bodies are made up about 60% water, 
My family's water is becoming more precious, as is the potable water on our planet. This book collaboration is in honor of my mom at 96. She wrote the poems included in this compendium in 1984. Realizing memories are fluid, Phyllis wrote her first poem to solidify her thoughts and feelings about her relationship to the natural world. From the point of view of touching pen to page, Phyllis wrote nonstop and produced these poems, musings on the existential and intangible. Her worlds haunt and inspire. They connect our bodies to water, our souls to the universe. I began the photographic series included in this compendium while in Osaka, Japan in the fall of 2019 for our exhibition, Signaling Water, Multi-Species Migration and Displacement. Our show was interrupted by a typhoon and I began photographing the torrential rains falling into the sacred river, Sumiyoshi, that flows to the water temple in Osaka. When I returned from Osaka, I continued the rain imagery in the tidal zones of La Jolla, California, where I grew up. My mom's poem reads, my words skim along the surface like skipping stones thrown into shallow pools, counting coop on the dead. This work explores the relationship between nature, art, and spirituality by documenting the moments when rain ripples across another body of water. The imagery, when mirrored, resembles the patterns we see utilized in art and architecture throughout time and around the world. While visiting my mother, we rediscovered these poems, which she wrote at nearly the same age as I am now. The two artists, mother and daughter, bonded over the shared sentiments of our work produced in the same age in different eras, and we decided to collaborate at last. Short poems are embedded into the remnants of rain ripples. I will read passages from some of my mom's poetry. Wonder is wrapped in absorbent black. Death is closed eyes and another awakening. I felt I could peel the green mountain from the blue page and paste it somewhere else. My mother and I had wanted to collaborate for 40 years. It took that time to discover exactly what that collaboration might be. We simultaneously looked down into the sea and up into the heavens. The cloud patterns created in this image remind me of the artwork displayed in the great domes of chapels across the globe. I stand in awe. How can rain striking water feel so much like glass? The patterns I recognize in these works remind me of our human history of mark making, the collective imagination of people making natural patterns, marks in caves and cathedrals on the great walls of pyramids and mosques in the Middle East. Somehow, these works bring me into the collective imagination of our humanity throughout time and place. This image is made from a photograph revealing the foam and suds stirred up during the first rainstorm of the year in the tidal zone of La Jolla. The beach and surrounding areas flooded in this storm. Sea level rise and more violent storms characterize changes associated with climate change. Here, my mother's poem comes to mind. Death is closed eyes and another awakening. Phyllis died during the pandemic, so only a few of us, due to the shelter-in-place mandate, could re return home to be with her during her final days. Phyllis ushered me into life, and I pledged to see her through her death. In those final moments, 
I kissed her tenderly, and a smile formed radiant on her lips. The expression lasted just an instant, and then my mom died in my arms. Phyllis's smile is not all that flashed on April 24th, however. The unseasonably heavy rain in La Jolla that year, the rains that marked the photographic work done for this book, also created a nutrient-rich overflow into the sea. Plankton grew, and the red tides followed. Those single-cell critters called dinoflagellites glow neon blue in response to the energies in their space as a form of protecting themselves from predation. By day, the windows of my mother's home looked out onto the red-brown waves, and by night, including the night of her death, we could see the blue glow of the dinoflagellites in the sea, providing a light show send-off. My mom's spirit was released into the Pacific. I'll close this episode of my presentation with the final three minutes of the film collaboration between my mother and I. The poetry included in this film is read by actor, director, and UCSD professor Alan Schneider in 1984. Oops. Ooh. We have to go back to my nights blister in dry dreaming of mud flats, once swollen with life's water, swimming tadpoles and tomboys on swift moving rafts. It's time to bring a new song to this twilight and sound it for each turn in the stone, facing west to cup moonbeams and star falls, standing still and alone, being free in the desert to follow each trace in the sand of grains climbing hillocks and wind games, sand dune walking, time as breath does demand. The sounds of early birds and shore waves crowd the narrowing space left for dreaming. Images float lazily in unhurried dimness, without feet or gesturing arms, like so many players looking for something to be cast in. Dancing dames on night-slippered toes dance the dance the memory knows from other dreams on other stages with other shoes from other ages. The same dance still. I am an emission of light from the darkness of everything. I am an emission of light that reflects the absorption of all color. I am a result of consciousness. I am not the cause of it. I know all this only when I am. Then I also am not. Eyes closed, peering, silent inner hearing, bones and muscles nearing the empty well of selfless self, expanding out into, contracting in with everything. In the dawn, I drag in my net with its harvest from the ocean of sleep. The tiny disc-like mirrors sewn into the cloth of night, each reflecting its own image of the whole. I closed my eyes and went into the silence to hear closed my eyes to sharpen my focus of attention. I closed my eyes to reach the blackness of everything. I closed my eyes to help me see. I closed my eyes to help me hear. I closed my eyes to learn to feel and know everything. I closed my eyes to take in the light. I close my eyes 
but not to sleep. My mom would have loved that you're here. When a lightning bolt struck a forest of fuel in Big Basin, California, close to the university, I began a reinvestigation of fire perspectives. This new and ongoing series combines fiction with reality, recognizing that wildfires are forever here in the native now in California. While reading the postcard text, I'm sharing an audio piece of the sublime tree song I recorded in the landscape pictured here. The eco-acoustics reveal the voices of the trees still standing, a biosonification and record of their breathing, eating, and thirst. Wish you were here. She was stunning, and she gifted us all the magic we'd need. The beaches, the mountains, ancient trees. Why live anywhere else? The orange dystopian sky colored our breath on September 9th, 2020. Our state of being was smoked and has been so for quite a while. Yours forever, fire. Living in California means accepting that wildfire is constant with us everywhere. Fire is a natural part of California's cycle. Indigenous Californians knew how to live with the ecology and created controlled burns to maintain the health of the landscape. We logged and removed the biggest, most fire-resistant old growth that burn in a moment but take centuries to grow. People moved deeper into the wildland urban sphere, seeking affordable serenity while discovering the sometimes fatal intersection of nature and culture nestled among the fuel, seeking the voice of those left standing forever fire. Next, I'll play a one and a half minute clip documenting the wildland urban interface as it stood shortly after the CZU firestorm in 2020. The clip features the voice of the few neighbors whose homes survived the firestorm in the Big Basin area. It's a very somber thing to be the only one to survive. And I mean, our house got all kinds of smoke damage. So we're, we're not even living back at home yet. Uh, hopefully in the next week. So it's sad that, that we lost our neighborhood and now we're just going to be part of the cleanup effort and part of the rebuilding effort. So Mark and Astrid over here, John over here, you know, they're very close friends of mine. Very sad though. We're gonna miss our neighborhood. And hopefully in another year, year and a half, we get it back. But then we still got a lot of years waiting for the growth to come back, the trees to come back. As you can tell, the piles of trees that they've cut down. Ugh, it's very scary. Thousands of years of growth gone in one day. The artworks conflate documentation from the fire scarred scape in the form of large scale photographic postcards, 3D point cloud scans, video, and bio data sonification from the surviving trees translated as song. The work highlights 
the voices of those left standing. Firehawks living in Australia use fire to catch prey. For thousands of years, Australia's Aboriginal people have sung stories about the sacred firehawks. Raptors that, according to lore, use fire to hunt and introduce fire to humans. Now merging traditional knowledge, firefighter reports and other sources have validated these legends. Raptor species in northern Australian savannas really do spread fire to smoke out prey. With this postcard series, I recreate the fire myths about birds and install the Natural History Museum's birds back into the sacred landscapes as an attempt to make things right again. The, the turkey vulture acknowledges taking journeys to queer places, guided along by a column of smoke, spiraling upward towards a pyral cumulus cloud. Maybe he flew just a little too close to the sun, melting his head feathers bald. Now he lives with a blackened beak, looking and sounding almost prehistoric. Next I'll play a one minute clip from the film Mounted Birds and Fire Myths. Within the hidden life of dying trees, she stroked the owl's head. Yellow round eyes wide open, crowned by a feathered horn. Wind lightly touching the outer down, fluttering, pulsating, animating the mounted creature, the legendary lightning bolt of lore. She, the arsonist, acknowledges her guilt while arranging the strange menagerie of birds in the fire-scarred scape. She alone ignites the firestorms. She is the dominatrix now, the prevailing influence on climate and environment. She tries to make amends with her sawdust-stuffed friends by returning them to their incinerated habitat knowing all the while she must do far more than that. But will she? This imagery is shot with a thermal infrared camera, which records heat. The recorded temperatures are relational, meaning the warmest segments in the scene are designated in warm colors, the cooler segments assigned green, blue, and purple hues. In creating the film I will share next, I was stunned to see the red trees turn green when a human entered the scene, reminding me that everything is relational. Dear Perceiver, you appeared in a black dress, but I had already donated my death to the lightning-scarred trees. I wore an infrared camera recording heat. We wrote in smoky script, our red hot bodies turned the woods green with envy. Perceiver and environment were involved with each other, maybe in love. Everybody, everything is connected in the relational forest where we met for the very first time. Love, environment. Next, I'll share a short clip created with an infrared camera. Our red hot bodies turn the woods green with envy. Everybody Everything is connected in the relational forest.
especially those warm wind moments when we were the only human spirits in the valley. And we were still as the landscape transformed itself beside us. Wheels in the relational forest appear and disappear, appear. We heard the sounds of the chainsaws slung by the volunteers deep in the basin. Seeker of the natural, I enjoyed your last note addressing prescribed natural fires in Yellowstone that allowed a lightning fire to burn under approved conditions, a prescription. Fire can be wild and controlled as an awesome restoration of nature. But please don't think our relationship falls within a similar pattern or set of conditions my nature will not be rewilded under your control. Artists create fiction by nature. Robin. In a moment, I'll play a one minute clip from a film I created while attending a prescribed burn within Blodgett Experimental Forest in the Sierra Nevada. Smoke and mirrors. The burn boss is aware of the archaeology of longing, loss, and legacy. She imagines shaping the landscape with prescribed burns to lessen the intensity of the inevitable wildfires. She wonders if the black lunged trees still standing sing survivor songs. Does the risque mother tree survive best within an environment sculpted by mastication and controlled burns, preparing her to outwit her hungry wildfires? Does cooking the planet make us a geologic force? You are a volcano lover. Robin. My name is uh, Jim Randerson, and I'm from the Department of Earth System Science at UC Irvine. And I'm here with um, Audrey today to study the smoke composition. And we're hoping to learn from the smoke um, what the chemical and the isotopic composition of the smoke is so that we can learn more about uh, the types of fuels that are being uh, combusted by the fire. Different uh, types of debris on this forest floor have different ages and depending on the time that they grew, the needles grew or the logs grew, they picked up a different uh, chemical composition from the atmosphere, a radiocarbon signature, a radiocarbon signature and that uh, is what, um, what we're measuring today. And so from the weapons testing that was done in the 1950s and 60s by the Americans and the Russians, uh, there's a big spike of radiocarbon in the air and it labeled all of the trees and all of the vegetation that grew during that time. And so we're able to use that, that spike to help us then figure out if the material that's burning that was uh, growing in the 50s and 60s, if, um, if that stuff is now combusting.
The text in this artist postcard informs the filmic mandala I'll show next, alluding to the healing human history of fire. Dearest flame, we have made history together. Fuel, oxygen, heat, that is our love triangle. You are unique to the earth and shaping your presence is unique to our humanity. We are your keystone species. Somewhere between the last Australopithecine and Homo erectus, hominins gained capacity to control fire and sculpt the landscape. You track our ecological agency. Touched by fire, Robin. Dear Perceiver, in an old growth forest, you are surrounded by death and dying. The truth is, the system depends on it. The forest absolutely requires death to, to survive. More than likely, you're tripping over it. You're marveling at the weird growth on the trees. You're listening to the hammering of woodpeckers without knowing how much death you're actually witnessing love, environment. Oops. And this is the final postcard today um, before a small clip to follow. When mother trees, the majestic hubs at the center of the forest communication, protection, and satience die, they pass their wisdom to their kin, generation after generation, sharing the knowledge of what helps and what harms, who is friend or foe, and how to adopt and survive in an ever-changing landscape. Elders that survived climate change in the past ought to be kept around because they can spread their seeds into the disturbed trees. Suzanne Samard is the woman who looked at a forest and saw a community. And I'm gonna leave you today with a three minute meditation on time and space framed by the connections between water and fire within an old growth mother tree or maybe not. Maybe I will give a tribute to my father who is being buried today as we are speaking now. Our bodies are 60% water. My father loved looking out towards the sea. Today his water may feed the thirst of a newborn tree. So my father and I, in the last year or so, in his 100th year, uh, worked together on a feature-length film. And I'm going to just show you a half a minute clip from the beginning and another half a minute clip from the end of that film in tribute to my father, Elliot Charles Lasser. I met you the moon. And let me dwell among the stars. Let me know what winter's like in Jupiter and Mars. In other words, hold my hand. In other words, I love you. <laughs> My dad is a radiologist. He uncovers the meta-narrative revealed within an x-ray. I too work with images, drawing with light as a photographer. Lately, my imaging device of choice is a thermal camera. Utilizing infrared radiation, 
heat and light to produce my father's portrait series celebrating his hundred years of living. When photographing my father with this tool, I record the heat evidence he leaves behind like a footprint. In this framework, my father becomes an avatar, a released soul in bodily form on earth. a voice that makes you realize that your voice is the song of your disappearing, which is our most common song, the knowledge of which, the understanding of which, the inhabiting of which might be the beginning of a radical love, a renovating love even. So says Ross. Okay. Two owls are serenading each other just outside my window, sitting just beside the family tree, here in the garden bedroom where I tried to grow up. Here in the room of ghosts, somehow forgotten and just remembered. The owls know. Also the skunk that sauntered down the hillside into the yard and danced just beside me as I projected images of my father and brother on their path towards the unknown. They both look so right, impregnating the tree with their essence. Glamour meets entropy. Skin meets tree. Amen. Thank you for exploring with me today. And I want to leave you uh, with a project that I'm really excited about. This summer in um, Redwood State Park in Big Basin, California, there's going to be a project called Art About. And uh, I want you to apply. So. All you have to do is submit a video as to why you should be chosen to romp in the woods. And if you're picked, we'll hike up a mountain. And at the top of the mountain, we'll be met with naturalists and scientists and poets and historians to fill us in on the last 100 years, that relatively recent history of that park. And the next day, we come down. You get a month to create a work of art that will then be exhibited and installed temporarily for the summer um, in Redwood State Park. It then becomes part of their permanent collection so that places like the San Jose Museum of Art or the Santa Cruz Museum can then um, borrow from their collections. So I'm hoping you'll all apply. And thanks for hanging out with me today. And I think we have your next presenter, presenters. We do have another presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, just. Um, we do have one more presentation, but two more. There's poetry to end the program. But I'm really pleased to be bringing from the Gila River uh, Basin um, ecosystem the Ellen J. Ranch, uh, Joel Slayton and Lisa Johansson, who are in their mobile lab doing ex environmental art on this delicate and very dry, until maybe recently, region of Arizona. Uh, Joel Slayton is from San Jose State University and started our cadre new media lab 
So without further ado, they're going to zoom in from Arizona on location. Thank you. So, hello, everybody. Hi. <laughs> it's uh, Joel Slayton and Lisa Johansson uh, piping in from Cliff, New Mexico, which is about 30 miles uh, north of Silver City. Uh, we're in a small, very, very small uh, ranching community. And um, as Molly mentioned, uh, I am Professor Emeritus there at San Jose State. I started the Cadre Laboratory for New Media in 1984, and um, have, I'm very proud of the progress of that, that enterprise as it's still quite active there at the university. Lisa? And I am the lesser known Lisa Johansson. Uh, I am the L of the L and J Ranch, and I will be um, talking to you today about work with the Gila River, but in my career, I have been a clinical research scientist and primarily concerned with individuals who have uh, neurological disorders. And I've been using brain imaging and electrophysiological measures to try to help people with cerebral palsy walk better and to help people with spinal cord injuries use their upper extremities better. And uh, used, very used to collaborating with multidisciplinary groups. She's the smart one. So uh, <laughs> to introduce uh, ourselves just a, a little bit further in the project, uh, let me uh, show this video for you. We live in really complex times. The political, social, and economic futures are uncertain. The artist as an experimental researcher has an opportunity to poke at and provoke those uncertainties in ways that will reveal new possibilities and more importantly, new ways of thinking about thinking. Like everyone else, we're in the midst of a transitional moment of how and what can be done to redefine, redirect, or reinvent ourselves. My career in clinical research has been motivated by a desire to make a difference in the quality of life for people with neurological disorders. The real challenge of science, I think, is learning to ask the right questions. Art is something that you do because you can do it and you can get away with doing it. On the other hand, the rigor of science and its methods are super important in terms of doing good qualitative research. The big question I have for you when you've given me some idea or you're proposing some new project, often my response is kind of centers around the question of like, well, so what? And my question to you centers around why bother? So the L J Ranch is the, this collaboration between Lisa and myself that we started in 2019. Um, and it was envisioned as a way to develop deep explorations into land use and sense of place challenges across rural America. And at the heart of the project was this idea of having a mobile laboratory, if you will, a virtual ranch, a ranch that could travel about, um, that the platform would allow us to um, have a full production studio and research laboratory that we could take with us on the road. Um, we have a you know whole variety of systems that we can deploy and use as we're investigating the environment um, from media collection tools, from drones, cameras, you know, surveillance devices, all, all kinds of, of, of resources. But we also have um, you know a full blown uh, media production capability for generating. Uh, content, which we do in an ongoing continuous way as we interact with the communities that we're 
we're uh, working with. Here's a quick example of just, you know, just to give you an idea of something that we shot. This, oops, sorry. Um, this, is un, this is under the Gila River, just a uh, short distance from here. Um, so we collect a lot of, of uh, visual material like this, um, which we will use later on in exhibitions and presentations and so forth. The project that we're working on started in 2019, and um, it's focused around the Gila River, uh, which is a 649 mile long river that begins in the headwaters of southwestern uh, New Mexico, close to where we are right now, and traverses out of that wilderness into Arizona. And as it moves across the state of Arizona, um, it meets the confluence of the Colorado in uh, the border of California and Yuma, Arizona. Um, along its path, lots of things happen to this river. And similar to California, the drought has been extraordinarily impactful to the Southwestern you know, US in general. But this river um, is very compromised by the activities along its path. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, those in just a second. This is where we are right now. Uh, we're at the Smith Ranch. This is our home base. Um, just out the, the door here, uh, maybe three or 400 yards is the Gila River. Um, it's, we're in the valley um, as the river emerges out of, the, out of the, the wilderness, just slightly north of us, where the river actually starts to become useful for human enterprise. Primarily in this area, it's agriculture and ranching mostly ranching. You do have to kind of climb that fence to get down there. Down to the river? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our, our dogs like to wander over there quite a bit. Um, Russell is uh, down there in the, the corner, in the left-hand corner of our, our picture here. Russell uh, went to high school with both of us. Uh, we went to high school together. So we've been a, a, a collaboration for over 40 years. And um, it was a sort of natural fit for us because Russell's Ranch um, is situated directly on the river and provides us access and a, and a start point for um, our exploration. I'd also add uh, too that I was talking to Russell last night just about the water rights that he has. And water rights in this area are a huge commodity. So they either come with the property, you can sell water rights, uh, you can sell them to big corporations, you can sell them to your neighbor, uh, or you can trade them. So uh, water rights here are a really big deal in this area where water is pretty much everything. Yeah, water is everything. So the headwaters of the Gila River really begin on the western slope of the Continental Divide, and the Gila flows southeast near the Gila cliff dwellings that were once inhabited by the Mogollon culture. And this is really between 600 and 1400 AD. So they've, they've really been there a long time. Uh, there are wilderness camp locations along the river that are available, but I think very few people who uh, know of them. And really to get up into that wilderness, you really have to have a good truck with a lot of clearance. <laughs> uh, the pristine environment is really untouched by all of those economic influences that are driving the land use in the Gila River Valley. And it is fiercely protected by environmental and community interests. So one of the things that really divides the environmental and the ranching communities is a huge effort to officially designate the Gila as a wild and scenic river. So Greater Gila Wild and Scenic Rivers Act is now currently a bill which would protect nearly 450 miles of the Gila and San Francisco rivers and their tributaries. And the bill is now sitting with the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources for consideration. As written, it protects existing traditional uses of the river, it permanently maintains historical water rights, and it preserves the healthy and free flowing nature of one of New Mexico's last remaining wild rivers. 
Uh, I believe it is Joe Manchin who is presenting this and has made some amendments to it. Although I think he just took out the warm and fuzzy pieces and left some of the more critical things intact. So, yeah, I was, oh. yeah, <laughs> I was just thinking as, as, you, were, as you were talking, um, rivers are political, right? And um, this one is extraordinarily political from its start to its finish. So not only does it have its, its uh, the impact from its cultural uh, use and its uh, use in other ways, but but the fact that that all rivers are political, and and when we look at at, at the Gila River in particular, it becomes a kind of um, a precursor to rivers all over the world in terms of the way in which we can begin to look at at the challenges that they face in terms of their their destiny and survival. Um, I, so yeah. free flowing rivers are really important uh, because they are recharging the groundwater. They're vital for the survival of the health of fish populations. They're improving the biodiversity. And because of the way they flow, they can help reduce flood and drought risks. So this is some drum footage that we shot this past year, uh, literally about uh, half a mile from where we are right now. And uh, it gives you some appreciation for what this river is doing as it flows through this high desert terrain. Um, the immediate ecosystems that it supports are very fragile and uh, any changes in it uh, can be quite dramatic. The, uh, we were down there yesterday and um, you know, one of the things California is exporting right now besides culture is weather. And uh, this place was come completely inundated uh, with, uh, you know, high water that's also flowing from rain and, and in the snowpack um, in, uh, in northern New Mexico and Arizona. But it gives you some idea that, of what we're talking about when we're saying 600 miles of the river, but 450 miles of it could remain relatively pristine if uh, the Water Act is passed. So the Gila River Valley really epitomizes all these complex relationships that are existing with regard to land use uh, among <laughs> indigenous people, ranchers, agribusiness, environmentalists, and their associated politics. And as we've just spoken, it really there really are a lot of <laughs> different complex relationships here. These are the irrigation ditches on a, a ranch not far from here. Um, and apparently there is, I have learned such a thing as a ditch boss that actually is uh, in control of rotating who's allowed to release water. And then the ranchers are responsible for opening some of these gates to irrigate their land. Many of these irrigation um, channels were um, built on or modeled around, uh, you know, hand dug trenches that uh, were done in over a hundred years ago in this community as it was being settled by, um, you know, the Mormons from who were looking for <laughs> the promised land. And um, of course, this area has been inhabited by um, indigenous peoples for tens of thousands of years, and, and um, it's really quite quite a transformation. So just south of the Smith Ranch, Freeport McMoran, which is an international company with current assets exceeding $51 billion. And I had to update that from 42 billion um, from our previous website uh, number because they gained about $10 billion in the last couple of years. They operate uh, the Tyrone Mine, which is an open pit uh, copper mining complex. You can see the gate here, but you can't see the mine because when we pulled up to see the mine, they, they chased us out. I'm not sure if that was security or because we had California plates, but we did not get to get in and see the mine. Um, and copper is extracted uh, using a process called copper leaching, which requires a lot of sulfuric acid. So on the way into the mine entrance, there's probably a couple hundred cars of these Sulfuric, filled with sulfuric acid to perform the, the leaching process. 
And the water source for the Tyrone mine is a diversion on the Gila River that pumps water to Bill Evans Lake, which is, uh, as you can see, very popular for fishing. <laughs> and from there, it gets pumped more than 12 miles uphill to the mine operation sites. And just to give you an idea of how much water a copper mine needs, they need about 100,000 gallons per ton. So Freeport McMoran estimate a 350% increase in the need for copper if the world is going to move to clean energy solutions like electric cars by 2050. So you can see this is a, a big carrot that they can use to convince people to support the copper mining industry. This is a, a narrative that we, we see constantly being replayed along the course of the Gila River where copper mining is, is central. Um, where there's this negotiation between uh, the, the design of recreational um, reservoirs for, for use by the public in exchange for water rights that also provide the resources that are the massive amount of res water resources that are necessary to support the copper mines. So who doesn't want a recreational lake near their home? <laughs> it's a good sell. Or a job, as the case might be. I found those lures at the lake, by the way. But you didn't catch a fish. I didn't. Um, so one of the things that, that we, we've discovered, and we're right sort of in the smack in the middle of this project of this Gila River, River investigation, um, getting ready to conduct phase two here in, in, in the next week with, with we traverse the Arizona portion of the river. Um, but, you know, we're, we found almost immediately that there was, you know, it's a very complex set of interactions between different constituencies who all have vested interest in the current use and future use of the river's resources and the water resources in the region. Understanding that the Gila River is, has a uh, watershed of about 60,000 plus square miles uh, along its course, it, you know, these uh, rivers, uh, ecosystem is much larger than the stream that one looks at. It's, it's, it's a, a you know, much more vast landscape. But these different kinds of constituencies are all at play simultaneously, um, negotiating the, the, the relationship. I think in one of the earlier presentations, we talked about this, this sort of human and intersection with the, with the natural uh, environment, natural systems. And it's, it's that complexity that started to really uh, grab our attention and we thought to ourselves well you know how do we look at that how do we think about that and uh being the two people we are coming from the backgrounds that we do come from we said well we need a model right funny you should mention that <laughs> so complexity as indicated here <laughs> is a characteristic of an ecosystem, which is a system of interactions between the environment and the relationships with both its natural and its artificial elements. So with any complex system, it has inherent plasticity and it survives based on its ability to respond to continuous changes that are happening in the physical, the cultural and biologic elements. So we started working on a model to understand how these competing interests might influence the destiny of the river. And we came up with the term ecoplasticity to define the natural and artificial challenges that can stimulate changes on how the river adapts to multiple competing forces. So there were a lot of arguments, maybe some wine involved, but we did manage to come up with a working model. So here is our working model. Uh, has cleaned up a bit from the whiteboard. And so for example, if you look at the red squares, uh, we're looking at properties of turbulence. In other words, these would be things that would influence the river as a result of both intentional actions like mining, agriculture, uh, recreation, or uh, natural events like flooding, fires, extreme weather. And these conditions are always mediated by the more temporary factors, which we have here in blue, 
that would be the current economics or the politics. And we're suggesting that these relationships would give rise to either temporary conditions or some permanent adaptations that would affect the river's survival. So, you know, like in any complex system, uh, dynamic system, um, how one looks at its uh, ability to adapt to its environment is a kind of critical uh, framework for appreciating the all the constituent factors that drive that, that system either towards uh, uh, chaos or into uh, stability. So we're uh, here in in Cliff, New Mexico, and um, as I mentioned earlier, getting ready to venture forth here in the next week, since the weather clears a little bit, um, across the mountains into Arizona. And um, a lot of things begin to happen to the river almost immediately. Um, it remains fairly, fairly pristine on its way to, to Arizona, but as it emerges into Arizona, um, a lot of things begin to happen in terms of the expansion of the of agricultural usage, mining, um, et cetera. And so the way we've been thinking about this project from a kind of con, in a, as a conceptual framework is that we've we've divided the the river into sort of nine districts that we're looking at. we've We've completed the first two, the uh, wilderness portion of the river and the Gila River Valley where we are right now. Um, as we enter into Arizona, um, we'll begin to look at several, several different things. So I thought I'd just show you a couple uh, of those that just to give you some flavor of where, where we're headed and what we're going to be uh, exploring. So um, the thing about the, the copper mining industry is that it is a clear form of industrialization of the water resources of the region. Um, Arizona is known for a lot of things. Um, especially in the last recent, you know, political cycles. But one of the things that it's known for is its copper resources. And one of the, the largest copper deposits in the US, actually in North America, has, uh, is, is in Arizona. It's um, going to be extracted using a very complex mining method that will result in a huge amount of of copper um, for use in some of the things that Lisa mentioned earlier, for example, electric cars and batteries and so forth. Um, so the industrialization of the river and looking at how the river um, is going to be impacted by the way in which the water resources is managed, is a very important part of what we're doing. Um, we will be spending a bit of time on the uh, San Carlos uh, Apache tribal nation uh, lands. Um, where the Gila River flows, but by the time it gets there, it's been relatively depleted. Um, depending on the the rain each year, um, you know, it'll have more or less water in it. But usually, it's it's really just a trickle at this point. So the 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 Indian tribal indigenous community um, had. Uh, has come up with, you know, really innovative st strategies for how to mediate um, the its water rights to um, this the, those resources and be able to man manage them in really unique ways that also help them manage the ecologies that that water supports. Um, and because of the different relationships with the land and the and their heritage with the land. Um, we feel like this is really going to be a rich experience for us to explore deep, in a more deep I, way. And I, I just want to add, they are often in a position of defending their water rights. Yeah. As the river, as the Gila River um, enters the Phoenix region, um, where it meets the Salt River coming down from the north, um, Phoenix for over a hundred years has been building out a very elaborate, complex network of canal systems that sometimes run dry, sometimes run with water. Um, you know, these are paved canals that provide and manage the resources for uh, what is one of the fastest growing uh, 
cities in the United States and how and that mediation um, is being realized in terms of its urban design becomes a very important part of what happens past Phoenix as the river uh, finds its way down through uh, Gila Bend and ultimately to Yuma where it meets the Colorado, where at that point it's virtually a non-existent. Um, so yeah, this gives you some idea of what of, of the directions that we're moving. Um, so a lot of times people ask this, you know, so you know, so what are the outcomes from all this? What are you what are you going to do with all this? And I mean, I think similar to Robin in, in her presentation, you know, we're doing this because we we love the land. We want to see this survive. And and we feel like you know the personal action that we can take is to be the adventurers and explorers who um, are telling a story that is otherwise maybe not being told. Uh, most people don't know anything about the Gila River or how compromised it is or how important it has been historically or how important it is today. And- Neither uh, did we. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah when, when we began the project. But as we as we go through the exploration, we we, we realize now as artists, uh, you know, yes, there there will, will be exhibitions that come out of this. Yes, there will be publications. Um, there will be material that you know we present on uh, a website that has uh, the activities that are kind of tracked in more or less real time. Um, but one of the things that we've been doing is is sort of producing what what we're calling takeaways. And takeaways are just like, well, what. What did you get? And, and, and is there is there an idea that seems to apply across the whole the whole system that, that we're looking at? And we just literally finished one yesterday, the first one, and um, it was done in collaboration with a colleague uh, Emily Bright, who is in uh, Rhode Island um, and working with has been working with us on the Gila project for some time. So let me just show you that. It's called Nature Doesn't Care. Nature doesn't care. To be wild is to be untamed, to be remote, desolate, and uninhabited. Human attempts to control what wants to be wild often results in dire consequences in the name of progress and or sustainability. Nature doesn't care. For 150,000 years, Homo sapiens have occupied and harvested nature in an attempt to control nature as a resource and as a commodity. Overpopulation, mismanagement of resources, pollution, and poorly conceptualized infrastructure serve to further exacerbate this human conflict with nature. It is a war that cannot be won. The complex ecologies of which humans are part is not cognizant. It is simply wild. Nature doesn't care does not want, need, or feel. It just is. So that just gives you a brief, you know, peek at, at what we're up to here. And um, we really appreciate being included and invited to uh, this event. And World Water Day is such an important occurrence uh, around the world. Um, so just to be included in that and have a chance to have our our, our little project, you know, uh, part of it is is really uh, welcome. And so we, we want to thank you. And so with that, yeah, I guess we're, we're there. It's my first art presentation. You did very well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So much, Joel and Lisa, that was amazing. Uh, this is Molly talking. Hi, Hi Joel. It's been a long time. That's a fantastic model. What an interesting project. I, I love listening to you talk about it and great photographs. Fantastic. So thank you for joining us and taking, making the effort to uh, tune, tune in and we'll tune in to you. Thank you so much. It was great. We have a lot of streaming audience on, on your... Uh, so very good. Okay, I am going to now, the last piece we're going to close the program with is uh, we have two of San Jose's most uh, celebrated poets, 
uh, Shika, and uh, Malav Mal I hope I'm saying this correctly, Malavia, and Arlene Biala, in a piece they've entitled Dreaming of Confluences, and this is uh, just the end of our program now, so whoever is still here, thank you very much for coming, ha uh, celebrating water with us on World Water Day 2023. I'll get them get settled at their mic. We hope to be here again next year celebrating World Water Day, and so thank you very much for coming. And without further ado, Shika and Arlene, you ready? Yes. Are almost ready to. S oh, you have your phone? Okay, wonderful. Do you want to read first, or? Well, um, Sister Aura, do you want to go first? And then we'll just all hang in your seat. Yes, I do. Okay, go ahead. Well, thank you very much for having us. Um, it's an honor and privilege to read our work um, in an event that's so meaningful. Um, so thank you, Dr. Maldi, <laughs> and thank you to Mosaic America, who also brought us here. And so, Today, um, I'm going to read a poem about water, ceremony, mythology, and the sacredness of water in rituals of daily life. And this is from my forthcoming book, In Her Own Voice, which is coming out this summer. Now, the speaker is Anandi Bai Joshi, India's first female doctor and the first Indian woman to study medicine in the United States in the 19th century. So here she's questioning why she was named after a tributary of the sacred Ganges River and what it means when women are compared to water. Interestingly, almost all rivers in India have women's names. Naming. I, is it really true that being named after a river is bad luck, a turbulent life? Are all women rivers then? And tell me the story again of how I came to be a paisley in your belly, why you named me daughter of the blinding sun, sister of the Lord of death, tumbling down to earth to meet her blue beloved, how I was born the same day as a goddess, Riverine, whose holy drops the priest sprinkled on my forehead 11 days after my birth, introducing me to this world, whispering into my ear, Yamuna, 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 a contract signed in water, a girl's fate sealed. Beautiful. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that, Shika. River, river, carry me home. Living river, carry me home. River, river, carry me home to the place where I come from. Mostly water we are, don't you agree? The fluidity of this conversation is not about a flag and patriotism. It's not about if you can see me put my hand over my heart for a false honor song or blast me for gagging when I see an American flag flapping from the back of a pickup truck or flying off my neighbor's porch. No, this conversation is mostly water. Like how the government, cho how the government choked the water supply to thousands of our native brothers and sisters fighting at Standing Rock for the flow and breath of water in their own land. How the water cannons blasted them along with rubber bullets and tear gas on a night of sub-freezing weather. It's the media blackout of Flint and the absence of mostly water you can drink, brush your teeth, and bathe your children in. No. This conversation is not about Ryan Lochte swimming through lies or about how the same people who would blast Kaepernick love Muhammad Ali. 
This conversation is about us, the mostly water, how we will surge, recede, and rise, how we will carry those who cannot swim, how we carry ourselves away from the riptides. So this next poem will hopefully be self-explanatory. Um, I'll first share a couplet, which is in Urdu and Hindi, whose meaning will reveal itself in the poem. And the poem's a little rambly, so stay with me. <laughs> and the poem is called, A Poet is Also Water. Unhe tere samundar ne duboya, unhe tere samundar ne duboya, jine tufan ka andaza bohot tha. And this is a couplet by Manzoor Ahmed. When I was in high school, I read this couplet in Urdu in one of those daily diaries that were given as office gifts. With sayings at the top of the page, those but ugly corporate diaries with plastic covers in brown or gray that would crack at the spine, the pages so thin like onion skin where the ink would bleed through. Those diaries parents seldom used and passed on to children, desperate to make anything their private, personal archives. And I remember the cheesy wisdom in those couplets they called Shero Shairi, poetry of lions is what I thought it meant. I was young and impressionable and took everything almost literally. So when I read a Shero Shairi that said, he who knew typhoons well drowned in a still sea, I started fearing water, but also worshiping it, how a few drops sprinkled as blessings are considered holy, while a deluge upends houses and trees, the lack of it making one delirious, while more of it cleanses, puts out fires. And the way it shifts, shifts shape and reflects like a mirror, is water not then a sorcerer, an assassin at the same time? Why, this is some sci-fi Star Wars shit that we carry within us. Water, that balance of the universe, squeezed in a couplet of two lines. I hope then you'll all agree that a poet must also be water. Thank you. I love the blessing of being able to stand up here with Ashika because it's actually the first time we've read together. So hopefully it's the beginning of many. Um, I want to thank you to Mosaic and to San Jose State University um, for having us here. Thank you for having this really important event. Um, we honor the water. It's World Water Day. Today actually in Oahu, Hawaii, um, they are honoring the water protectors and uh, thanking them for bringing light to the, uh, you know, the devastation and the water crisis that's happening there. So this, this uh, next poem is dedicated to the water protectors and also for folks who, if you're thinking about, you know, I know next week is spring break for San Jose State and many other schools. Um, a lot of people thinking they wanna go to paradise, right, in Hawaii and have their vacation. Um, so it's, it's important to be aware of um, what, what you might envision as paradise and what is actually happening and how we need to uh, educate each other and, and uh, kokua and help the universe. This is called Aloha Forever or Shut Down Red Hill. Kai, kai, kai. Yamaya lodo, kai kai kai, ase su lodo, kai kai kai, yamaya lodo, kai kai kai, ase su lodo. Aloha forever, shut down Red Hill. When you think of paradise, do you think of poisoned water? When you imagine what paradise tastes like, 
Do you think of leaking jet fuel, PFAS, or forever chemicals in your Mai Tai with crushed ice or your seared ahi salad? Picture the Red Hill Underground Fuel Storage Facility. It's there on the map near Pearl Harbor. It sits directly above the freshwater aquifer that supplies the island of Oahu with the bulk of its drinking water. Red Hill, courtesy of the US Navy. Red Hill, in 2021, 20,000 gallons of fuel leaked into the clear water supply of more than 90,000 residents. Red Hill, turn on your tap to an oily sheen, to stench of fuel, sudden skin rashes, headaches, stomach aches, and hair falling out in clumps, Red Hill. Several years later, the Navy is doing its own testing of the water. No, 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 drink the water, it's fine, it's fine. Drink the water, they promise. But this is not what we mean when we talk about truth. This is not what we mean when we talk about justice. This is not what we mean when we talk about love. What we mean when we talk about paradise is demilitarization. What we mean when we talk about love is shut down Red Hill now. Stop the lies and recognize that when you stand with the stewards of the Aina, the land, is when your hands will begin to rinse clean. Ola ikabai, mini uchoni, water is life. Thank you, Ashe. And if you have the means and the desire, please follow and support the Oahu Water Protectors and Red Hill Mutual Aid. You can find them if you Google them or on Instagram. Thanks very much. Thank you. So that concludes our World Water Day celebration. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for streaming in the live stream and paying your uh, respects to water in that respect. And thank you. We'll hope to see you next year in World Water Day. And have a good evening. Don't float away. Bye. And thank you, Molly, because you're awesome. <laughs> and you've put so much energy and love and research into this Thank you. Event today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. It means a lot from you. Thank you.